Sometimes scientists get things wrong, and sometimes their discoveries are subject to such unique circumstances that they're left in doubt until someone else can come along and prove that they're right. In this video, we're taking a look at the strange discovery of a set of fish, and how for nearly a century, the mystery of their existence has persisted. Welcome back to All About Nature. On my channel, I try to bring nature-related content that's both educational and entertaining. If you enjoy this kind of content, then please consider liking the video, leaving a comment, or even subscribing to the channel. Now let's get into the video and take a look at the mystery of the untouchable bathysphere fish. In December 1934, National Geographic printed a story called A Half Mile Down by William Beebe. The subtitle read, Strange creatures, beautiful and grotesque as figments of fancy, reveal themselves at windows of the bathysphere. The article recounted with detail the inspiring adventures of two men who were the first to get deeper than 1,000 feet in the ocean, ultimately surpassing 3,000 feet. And it described the strange new creatures that they saw during their various trips to the ocean's depths. These two men were well respected. Otis Barton was the inventor of the bathysphere, a small, round, metal submersible that he hoped would allow two people to go deeper than any other submersible at the time could. William Beebe, the author of the National Geographic article, was even more respected. He was a pioneer of marine biology, ecology, and oceanography. He studied birds, ecosystems, marine life, and insects. Over the course of his career, he published over 800 biological articles, 21 books, and he personally described 88 different species. In 1930, our only understanding of the deep sea was pieced together from the creatures that were pulled up in nets or that washed up on beaches. In fact, Beebe had spent much of the late 1920s studying these deep sea fish by examining whatever local fishermen in Bermuda were pulling up. But the bathysphere changed that. Other submersibles at the time could only go to about 400 feet deep, but they had no windows. In contrast, the bathysphere could drop to depths thousands of feet below the surface, and most importantly, it had two tiny quartz windows, only 15 centimeters in diameter, that allowed those inside to peer out into the abyss. Between 1930 and 1934, Beebe and Barton executed a series of deep-sea expeditions off the coast of Bermuda. But it was in September of 1932 that their most controversial dive would occur. Only Beebe and Barton were in the vessel, and they had no camera to accompany them. Along with the thick cable keeping the bathysphere from falling to the bottom of the ocean, there was a telecommunication cable that allowed the pair to speak with a team up on the boat that they were attached to. Beebe would describe what he was seeing through the windows, and a woman named Gloria Hollister, who was up in the boat above, would write it all down. Beebe had seen many fish on his previous dives, but they were all fish that he had seen in the nets before, or that would later be physically collected and identified. But on this particular dive in 1932, Beebe would describe five new species of fish, all of which would never be seen again. Two years after the dive, Beebe wrote about the fish in a series of articles, including the one he wrote for the National Geographic. Else Bosselman, a German-born artist with the New York Zoological Society, played an important role in documenting the species Beebe saw. While Beebe was on his dives, Gloria Hollister would take notes of the descriptions he was giving, and as soon as he surfaced, he would use the notes and his memory to describe each species to Bosselman, who would paint plates of each of them. She rendered over 300 plates for Beeb in the time that she worked with him, and it was her drawings that were featured in the National Geographic article. They're also the only real depictions 
of each of these species that we have today. In his various articles, Beeb tells the story of each of the new species he encountered on the dive in amazing detail, often infusing his writing with superlatives and drama. While this certainly added to the entertainment of the reading, it later raised red flags about the accuracy of his descriptions. The first new species Beep mentions that he spotted was at 1,500 feet down, and again at 2,500 feet. He named it the Pallid Sailfin, and he described it like this. A large fish swung suspended, half in, half out of the beam. It was poised with only a slow waving of fins. I saw it was something wholly unknown. The strange fish was at least two feet in length, wholly without lights or luminosity, with a small eye and good-sized mouth. Later, when it shifted a little backwards, I saw a long, rather wide, but evidently filamentous pectoral fin. The two most unusual things were, first, the color, which in the light was an unpleasant pale olive drab, the hue of water-soaked flesh an unhealthy buff. It was a color worthy of these black depths, like the sickly sprouts of plants in the cellar. Another strange thing was its almost tailless condition, the caudal fin being reduced to a tiny knob or button, while the vertical fins, taking its place, rose high above and stretched far beneath the body, these fins also being colorless. I missed its pelvic fins and its teeth, if it had any, while such things as nostrils and ray counts were, of course, out of the question. It comes from deep in the abyss and swims with ghostly sails, with no visible increase of fin vibration. My pallid sail fin moved into outer darkness, and when I had finished telephoning the last details, I ordered a further descent. Next, at 1,900 feet down, was an interesting set of fish Beeb named the Five-Lined Constellation Fish. He wrote, A small school of luminous fish had just passed, when fortunately, at a moment of suspension, came a new and gorgeous creature. I yelled for continuance of the stop, which was at 1,900 feet, and began to absorb what I saw a fish almost round with long, moderately high, continuous vertical fins, a big eye, media mouth, and small pectoral fins. The skin was decidedly brownish. Along the sides of the body were five unbelievably beautiful lines of light, one equatorial, with two curved ones above and two below. Each line was composed of a series of large, pale yellow lights, and every one of these was surrounded by a semicircle of very small but intensely purple photophores. The fish turned slowly and, head-on, showed a narrow profile. If it were at the surface and without lights, I should, without question, have called it a butterfly fish or a surgeon fish but this glowing creature was assuredly neither, unless a distant relation, adapted for life at 300 fathoms. In my memory, it will live throughout the rest of my life as one of the loveliest things I have ever seen. After the five-lined constellation fish, Beep came across what is now the most famous of the five species that he described that day, the giant dragonfish, or untouchable bathysphere fish. It's famous because Beep claims that it's about three times larger than the largest known species of dragonfish today, and he described it like this. At 2,100 feet, I had the most exciting experience of the whole dive. Two fish went very slowly by, not more than six or eight feet away, each of which was at least six feet in length. They were of the general shape of large barracudas, but with shorter jaws which were kept wide open all the time I watched them. A single line of strong lights, pale bluish, was strung down the body. The usual second line 
was quite absent. The eyes were very large, even for the great length of the fish. The undershot jaw was armed with numerous fangs, which were illuminated either by mucus or indirect internal lights. Vertical fins, well back, were one of the characters which placed it among the sea dragons, Melanostomiatids, and were clearly seen when the fish passed through the beam. There were two long tentacles hanging down from the body, each tipped with a pair of separate luminous bodies, the upper reddish, the lower one blue. These twitched and jerked along beneath the fish, one undoubtedly arising from the chin and the other far back near the tail. I could see neither the stem of the tentacles nor any paired fins, although both were certainly present. This is the fish I subsequently named Bathysphera intacta, the untouchable bathysphere fish. Next to be spotted were some fish that Beep named the three-starred anglerfish. He came upon them at 2,470 feet and described them like this. A new anglerfish came out of all the ocean and hesitated long enough close to my window for me to make out its dominant characters. It was close in many respects to the well-known genera Ceratius and Cryptosparus, but the flattened angle of the mouth and the short, even teeth were quite different. It was six inches long, typically oval in outline, black and with small eyes. The fin rays were usual except that it had three tall tentacles or elysia, each tipped with a strong, pale yellow light organ. The light was clearly reflected on the upper side of the fish. In front of the dorsal fin were two pear-shaped organs, exactly like those of the common cryptosparas. The paired fins escaped me. No pioneer, peering at the Martian landscape, could ever have a greater thrill than did I at such an opportunity. Finally, Beeb saw what might be the most colorful fish of the dive at the greatest depth when he reached 2,500 feet. He named them the Abyssal Rainbow Gar. This was the only species he described that he didn't give a scientific name to, primarily because he himself wasn't quite sure what type of fish they actually were. I turned the light on suddenly and saw a strange quartet of fish to which I have not been able to fit genus or family. Shape, size, color, and one fin I saw clearly, but abyssal rainbow gar is as far as I dare go, and they may be anything but gars. About four inches overall. They were slender and stiff with long, sharply pointed jaws. They were balanced in the center of the electric ray when it was first turned on, and the unheard of glare affected them not at all. There they stood, for they were almost upright and I could see only a slight fanning with a dorsal fin. Keeping equal distance apart and maintaining their upright pose, they swam slowly into the uttermost dark. The amazing thing about them was their unexpected pattern and color. The jaws and head were brilliant scarlet, which, back of the gills, changed abruptly into a light but strong blue, and this merged insensibly into a clear yellow on the posterior body and tail. Unless in the light of some other fish, or in my electric path, their colors could never have been visible, and were assuredly useless byproducts. After the dives, Barton confirmed that this was in fact what they saw, and at the time, even without having collected a holotype, no one doubted them. But as the years passed, the fish became more and more of a mystery. Deep sea exploration continued to develop, yet these untouchable bathysphere fish weren't being seen on any other dive or caught in any net. Today, the four species that received Latin names are considered nomen dubia due to their uncertain status as species. And several theories about their identities or what might have happened to them, have been put forward. The first theory is that Beeb was actually making it all up. 
Many contemporary scientists of Beeb didn't believe him not because they didn't think that the fish could possibly exist, but because of his writing style in the articles that he produced. By including fanciful language clearly intended to appeal to non-scientific readers, scientists felt that the depictions were unreliable and the species were dismissed as hoaxes. A more common theory, however, is that Beeb was just mistaken. It would have been difficult to see out the tiny window. Size estimates and detailed descriptions would have been extremely hard to make. In fact, several times in his writings, Beeb admits that he couldn't make out important details of the fish, such as fins, gills, or scales. Perhaps he saw other, now known species out the window, but he simply didn't describe them properly. Two overlapping fish could have appeared as a six foot long giant dragonfish. Floating bioluminescent jellyfish or crustaceans could have deceived him into thinking the fish had features that they actually didn't have at all. Another theory is that he was hallucinating. Because of the extreme depths the pair had gone to, they may not have been aware of some of the dangers they were facing in regards to the air that they were breathing. We know that the air quality in the bathysphere was terrible, and probably high in carbon dioxide, which is known to cause hallucinations. Could Beeb have hallucinated the fish he saw? And if so, how is it that Barton was able to apparently corroborate the fish that Beeb claimed to see? It doesn't seem likely that the pair would have hallucinated the same sea creatures at the same time. Another theory is that these fish did in fact all exist, and were seen by Beeb and Barton, but that now they're all extinct. Overfishing throughout the world's oceans means that many deep sea species have been threatened by fishermen's nets, even before anyone is able to scientifically observe them. Could Beeb's untouchable fish have been wiped out shortly after he observed them? Was he witnessing the last of their kind? The final theory is that the species are still out there, waiting to be rediscovered. It's entirely possible that we just haven't come across the fish that Beeb and Barton witnessed on their dive since 1932. We've only explored about 5% of the deep sea, and there are many species that are known to only live in small localities around a single deep sea vent or cliff face. Could it be that we just haven't explored in the right places again, and so are yet to confirm that these interesting species of fish are still out there? Even on land, we can find a species and not see it again for over a century, so it doesn't seem too out there that these fish are still extant and may be seen again in the future. Whatever the explanation is, we can all agree that it's strange that a scientist as respectable as William Beebe, who successfully described new species on a regular basis, would describe five new species on a single dive without any of them ever being seen again. What do you think is the most likely explanation? Let me know in the comments below. And that's it for today's video. I need to say a special thanks to my patrons whose ongoing support allows me to make videos weekly. If you want to join us on Patreon, check out the link in the video description below. And if you want to watch a video on rediscovered lost species, click the thumbnail on the screen now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.